right, we're back in the Fitz News studios for the Week in Review, an explosive week here at Fitz News. A huge interview dropped earlier this week with Lindsay Edwards, a former sex worker who detailed her experiences with Alec Murdoch. But for those of you who watched that interview, you know the story's much bigger than that. We're going to dive back into that and talk about the response to that interview over the last few days. It's been nothing short of seismic. In addition to that, we're going to update you on the latest on the William Timmons affair scandal up in Greenville, South Carolina, a story that has really dominated discussion in the upstate. We've got some news on that that we broke just yesterday, as a matter of fact. We're going to get into that. We've also got a big update in the Murdoch murders, crime, and corruption saga, a ruling from South Carolina Circuit Judge Clifton Newman addressing requests to gag those proceedings and seal motions related to that case. Judge Newman had a big ruling on those motions, and we're going to get into that. We're also going to get political this week as the Fitz News crew traveled to Greenville, South Carolina earlier this week for a press event held by Democratic gubernatorial nominee Joe Cunningham. Now, Cunningham was in Greenville to unveil his lieutenant gubernatorial choice, which has been the subject of some scandal, as our news outlet exclusively reported. But at the event, there's another issue I want to discuss, that of ageism. We're going to get into that in the show. I want to hear your thoughts on it as well. And last but not least, we're going to finish up with Bowen Turner. We've been working hard. Our director of special projects, Dylan Nolan, for the last few weeks on a documentary related to this case, which again, it's the vectors, the intersection, the Venn diagram of so much that's wrong with South Carolina's injustice system. We're going to dive into that and let you get another look at that amazing documentary that Dylan did, which drives home everything that's wrong with South Carolina's justice system. All this and more coming your way, folks, on The Week in Review. So I've done a lot of interviews since we launched the video offerings here at Fitz News, done a lot of interviews that you've seen here on The Week in Review. But I don't think we've done one that was quite as gripping, quite as jarring, that produced quite the response as the interview that we did with Lindsay Edwards. A lot of folks have sat in this chair, people. Been asked a lot of questions. Broken a lot of news. But again, I don't think anyone who's sat there has had quite the impact that Lindsay Edwards has had. And I wanted to get into that a little bit. Lindsay, if you watch the interview, you know she's a former sex worker from the low country. Uh, and that's a term of art because we talked with Lindsay before the interview. And she said, listen, there were some times, yes, this was a, a job that, you know, Sometimes I even enjoyed it, but it was a position that she was forced into when she first started. And as it relates to Alec Murdoch, the second, third, and fourth times that she was with the future killer, accused killer, she was not a willing participant. So in those cases, Lindsay uses the term trafficked, and I think that's important because that is the bigger story here to me anyway, is this culture that we have somehow allowed in our state, in our country, where the right of a woman to, if she would like to engage in this, is completely taken over by pimps, madams, enforcers who work with law enforcement, dirty cops. It's just unbelievable. But the story that Lindsay told, again, is much bigger than Alec Murdoch. But I did want to start with a clip from that interview where Lindsay talks about one of her experiences with the former attorney from Hampton, South Carolina, who, again, at this time, no one knew outside of the 14th Circuit in South Carolina who he was. But Lindsay found out the hard way just what he's capable of. And here's a clip from that interview. Let's fast forward to... Uh, late 2014, early 2015. I know you don't have the precise date, mm -hmm. but you were dispatched with how many other girls was it? Uh, it was usually two to three other girls in the car. You were sent to a beach house on the Isle of Palms. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Tell us about that particular trip. Um, well, that was probably like, I guess you can say like one of the first times that it was, it had sort of like a private party sense to it of like, I guess what was portrayed to me. 
Um, we all went into the house, even my madam. And it was a group of us. We were going in there. It was apparently like a guy's weekend or something like that. And there was like a bunch of guys there drinking, doing drugs, had a fire going on the deck and eating food, just hanging out and stuff like that, which literally for I think it was a good like the first hour, hour and a half that we were there. That's literally what we did with them. We were taking shots, doing cocaine, smoking weed, hanging out by the fire and just talking and like almost like getting to know them in a way. Mm -hmm. And that's where I met Alex Murdoch. And I I remember that like, I mean, there was at least enough girls for like everybody that was there. There was one man that was passed out in a room. So I, I think um, my madam didn't have to service anybody that night. And they kind of just like had like their pick of the crowd between like the girls and everything. And he attached himself to me in a way. And he was very, he was very nice and everything like that. Very gentlemanlike at first. And we talked about like what he did for job, what his name was, where he worked. He told you his name. Yeah. He actually did tell me his name. He told me that he was a personal injury lawyer out of uh, Hampton, South Carolina. And I was like, oh, that sounds really familiar. I was like, I live in Beaufort. And he's like, oh, you live in Beaufort? And he's like, oh, I like you more already. And like, we kind of connected on that. We talked about different places to eat in Beaufort, like Alvin Ord's, Plums, Panini's, stuff like that. So he's treating you with respect. He's yeah. engaging you in a... And, and a good conversation. So, I mean, like, I, I, I felt safe at that point. I didn't feel like it was really that bad of a situation I've I was in a lot worse situations before and I was unfamiliar with people going to like hotel rooms with random people that just came off a back page and stuff where I was extremely uncomfortable because I had no idea who they were so I guess you can say having like a more like one-on-one intimate conversation with somebody and actually getting to know them more than just a fake name kind of put me at ease a lot more and spending time with them talking about different alcohols and stuff like that and drinking and just different stuff to do around the area it, it wasn't that bad at the point like at that moment sure and when it came time to actually have to service them like i i my expectations were still pretty high i was like okay shouldn't be that bad i've already done this a good like hundreds of dozen times at this point i was like this shouldn't be that bad i mean he seemed like a really nice person but i was violently choked with both hands like being pinned down to the bed in a way by my throat and it was to the point where i couldn't breathe by him by him by alec yes. murdoch yes at this beach house yeah and um, I was pinned down to the bed by my throat with both hands to the point where I it was like almost like I was blacking out. I was seeing spots. I was seeing stars. I was beating and scratching on his wrist as much as possible to get him to stop because I thought at that moment I was going to die. And it was also while being violently penetrated. And I think it was like as soon as it was he was done I couldn't have gotten up and ran out as fast as possible even completely naked I just grabbed everything off the floor that was mine and just ran out of the room and went to a bathroom and locked the door to get dressed and just kind of like collect myself and fight back to tears at that point so one of the things when we spoke with Lindsay before this interview we talked about how the Murdoch story was sort of the flame that would draw the moths, right? It was the lightning rod. It was the thing everyone was looking for. But that her story was much bigger than that. And I alluded to it earlier. It's not just about this high-profile client. It's about the lifestyle that she was forced into. Who props that lifestyle up? How is that lifestyle sustained? 
Obviously, we know that there was a very corrupt madam who was a part of this, but that madam did not operate in a vacuum. And I felt one of the most compelling aspects of that interview with Lindsay Edwards were her allegations that multiple law enforcement agencies in South Carolina have dirty cops in their ranks who were not only providing protection and information to her madam, but were receiving sexual favors from Lindsay and other girls as part of their payment for this service. That's about as bad as it gets, folks, when you've got law enforcement officers sworn to protect people who are instead literally abusing them as a way of empowering their abusers. And I want to cut real quick. Here's a clip of Lindsay explaining just how that unfolded. These are powerful men. Did you get the sense that after this happened, especially the way that your madam and the guy who was supposed to be protecting you, the way that they reacted, did you get the feeling that these guys were above the law? Or? Yeah. I mean, she always fear-mongered us of how far her reach was, I guess you can say, of who she would service, who other girls have serviced, who she knows, why she's been able to get away with this for upwards of, I think it was like 25 years when I met her. Wow. And that if we did or said anything, we would basically fall off the face of the earth and nobody would have a clue or trace as to why. And... I mean, we ended up servicing mayors, judges, solicitors, district attorneys from other states. Police officers. Police officers. Tell us a little bit about that, because this is where it gets very interesting. Some of those uh, appointments with police officers were not so much, uh, you know, it was more for information for your madam. Is that correct? Yeah, she had somebody on the inside with um, SLED and basically every police department in the areas that she would service as well. That would give her information on stings and where they were located, what numbers they would be calling from, what names that they were even using as fake names when they would call in. And when we would go to the appointments where we would service the police officers, they would never give us money. She's like, oh, no. These these are ones that are part of our list to help us. And I was just kind of like, okay, didn't think much of it. And these are police at, at which level? City, state, sled, all of them. And you were essentially having sex with them in exchange for them providing her with... Information and protection in a way. I guess I wow. could say. It was more so like... Instead of getting our set price of donations, we wouldn't get anything. And she's just like, you don't have to ask for donations here. You just go in and do this. Or she would even do it herself. And then if we did it. She would do it herself. Yeah. Even sometimes she would do it herself as well. And when we would get back into the car, um, since we didn't receive donations from them, she would pay us out of her own money our normal cut of what we would got from our donations anyway, which was about like 160 to $180. So since this interview aired, our news outlet has been inundated with responses. There were people praising Lindsay's courage, people asking about other names related to this. And folks, there are other names. <laughs> but that's Lindsay's story to tell. She's been in discussions with attorneys about how to tell it, where to tell it. We're going to let her do that because, again, those choices are up to her. This is a woman who was denied that right for a long time, the ability to set the narrative, to make those kind of decisions in her own life. We're not going to make those decisions for her. Are there a lot of names that you've probably heard before linked to this scandal? Absolutely. Are those names going to come forward at some point? I suspect so. And could those names implicate others in this still unfolding crime and corruption saga? I believe so. I believe so. But for now, Lindsay Edwards and her story should make us think about what sort of culture we want to live in, people. 
are we going to allow human traffickers to take girls as sex slaves, essentially, and have them service these powerful clients, this, these networks of influential men? Something's got to give, folks. And if Lindsay Edwards and the interview that she gave here this week is the straw that breaks that camel's back, that gets us on a road toward a serious conversation in this state about human trafficking, not just lip service from politicians, then her courage will be rewarded. But from my perspective, the woman that sat in this chair, most courageous person we've ever had on. And I just can't thank Lindsay Edwards enough for trusting us to tell the story right and for having the courage to see this thing through as it moves forward. So stay tuned for much more on the Lindsay Edwards front as we continue to work with her and work with those who have been impacted by this in an effort to not only get to the truth about what happened, but to try to get the sort of changes, just like we're working with the changes in the judicial system, judicial reform in the state, to try to create the sort of change that's necessary to keep what happened to her from happening to other girls. All right, so another big story that we covered this week involves William Timmons, the South Carolina 4th District Congressman who has been at the epicenter of a, an affair scandal, one which has dominated discussion in the South Carolina upstate, thanks in no small part to the husband of the woman he was allegedly sleeping with. That, that man's name is Ron Rollis. If you remember, Fitz News traveled up to Greenville a few weeks ago, did an exclusive interview with him, which pretty much broke the internet, folks. It was an incredible discussion in a church that Rollis painted pink uh, to draw attention to this issue. That's one way to do it. Um, but as we have dug into this issue, and looked at the Tim and Saga from all different angles. One of the things we wanted to do was dig into financial records, property records, any other papers that we could find, which would lend some context to this story, because these things don't happen in a vacuum. Uh, moves that people make don't happen by accident. And in fact, when we broke this story, I want to remind people, we didn't intend to break it. We'd received rumors about Timmons and this extramarital affair, but Fitz News, again, libertarian. We're not going to dive into somebody's bedroom and deal their dirty laundry. That's not, that's not what we do. And everyone knows that's not what we do. Timmons people know that's not what we do, which is why we didn't ask Timmons for a statement about the affair allegations, which is why we never told him we were planning to run an article because we weren't. Timmons gives us an unsolicited statement asking for prayers, for privacy, as it relates to difficult personal matters. Again, this was calculated. This was calculated. And I think we found out a little bit more this week, just yesterday, in fact, a story we published about how calculated it may have been. 16 days before Timmons issued that statement to our news outlet, there were documents filed in the Greenville County Clerk of Court's office, two property documents. One was a deed transfer where William Timmons deeded property to his wife, Sarah Timmons, 5.41 acres in Greenville County, a very valuable piece of property where a major construction is currently underway. Don't know a precise value on this property, but it's significant. But that wasn't the only document filed. In addition to the deed, there was an option agreement that was filed. And this option agreement allows William Timmons to buy the property back from his wife at any time over the next six years. In fact, there's actually an option for two more years. Uh, and those dates, incidentally, coincide with the timing of Republican primary elections. So it's almost like he's purchasing options for his political future. 
But within that option agreement was something that I found very suspicious. It's a confidential agreement that was signed by Timmons and his wife on May 30 of this year, 2022. And that, op, that confidential agreement governs the repurchase of that property. So Timmons has entered into a secret deal with his wife over a piece of property that he has given her. And according to my sources, this deal was entered into shortly after Sarah Timmons discovered her, her husband's latest alleged infidelity. Again, I don't care about affairs, people. I really don't. We would never have written about this, never have written about this if Timmons hadn't made it a public issue with his statement. But when you start going into confidential, secret real estate deals, because that's what this looks like. It looks like he's purchasing his wife's silence with this huge piece of property. And by the way, Sarah Timmons has been quite as a church mouse since the story broke, not a Pete. It's just suspicious. Again, I don't know what that deal was. But this man is a U.S. congressman. He is running for re-election in November. He is the Republican nominee for this office, which, by the way, he decided to leak the story you know, literally two weeks after he wins his, his party primary. Very convenient timing. But nothing about this is right, people. Nothing about it's right, whether it's him leaking it or whether it's these questionable property deals. But I'll tell you one thing. Timmons went on the radio in Greenville, South Carolina, two weeks ago, and attacked this news outlet, the very news outlet he used to, to get this into the bloodstream, attacked us as gutter gossip. We made a decision right then to pull every piece of paper that this guy has ever put his hand on. Ever. So William Timmons, we're going to find out what that confidential agreement included, one way or the other. And I certainly hope for your sake that it does not involve purchasing the silence of someone related to a story you're trying to keep under wraps or control. Because we will find it. We will find it. And I'll tell you one thing, whatever you think about this scandal, if you're a voter in the South Carolina 4th Congressional District, is this the kind of guy you want representing you? The kind of guy who touts family values but is conducting secret deals in the background related to getting busted for affairs? Again, it's not the affair I care about. It's not the affair I care about. No one would have written about that. But William Timmons, again, made this a news, news story. And guess what, Congressman? That story's going to continue because we are on the case now. All right, so our next segment this week is the Murdoch Murders Crime and Corruption Society. Yes, I know. It's in the third block of the show this week. That hardly ever happens. Usually the Murdochs are driving the train. And I know that this is sort of like a catnip for a lot of our audience, right? <laughs> they watch the show just to get the latest on the Murdoch murders. But there was some big news in the case this week. And it was a victory, as a matter of fact, for those of you who care about transparency in this case moving forward. If you recall, this news outlet exclusively reported last month that Alec Murdoch would be indicted on murder charges, which he was. And at that bond hearing for those charges in Walterboro, South Carolina, a motion was made by Murdoch's defense attorney, Dick Harpootlian, and by the presiding prosecutor in the case, Creighton Waters, from the office of South Carolina Attorney General Alan Wilson, a joint motion, if you will, was made to Judge Clifton Newman to impose a gag order on this case. And Harpootlian, in fact, wanted to go even further and have all motions related to the, to the case sealed, where it would be up to the judge to decide whether or not these, these documents were released. Now, fortunately, Judge Clifton Newman has been a longtime advocate for transparency in South Carolina courtrooms. And at the hearing in Walterboro last month, he made it clear he did not like this, this gag order idea. In fact, he said that he was, you know, of the belief that this was a public trial, that it should be conducted in public, which, by the way, is consistent with the South Carolina Constitution, which explicitly states 
the courts in South Carolina are public. Nobody should deny access, and yet, unfortunately, it happens all the time in South Carolina. And the reason it happens in South Carolina is because if you've been following this program, Fitz News, long enough, you know that South Carolina is one of the only two states in the country where lawmakers appoint judges, where lawmakers set the salaries for judges for their entire budgets. So what do we expect judges to do? The will of the lawmakers, particularly the powerful lawyer legislators who go into court all the time, rep clients, get sweetheart deals, like one we'll talk about later on another segment of this show. But to his credit, even presented with a fait accompli by the office of Alan Wilson, Judge Clifton Newman had the guts to say no. No, we're going to do this on the record, in the open, motions, all of it's going to be done in public. He rejected the proposed gag order. And I just got to say, I, you know, Judge Newman, he's somebody who I don't agree with every decision he's ever made. There's, in fact, a case in Columbia, South Carolina, I think he was a little bit too lenient on a, on a guy who shot a firearm in a bar, gave him a, a bond that I thought was too low. We'll be talking about that next week. But on these high-profile items, whether it was Alec Murdoch's bond last fall and whether it was this gag order, Newman has been put in a position where he could go one way and side with that status quo, with that secret system, with that catering to lawyer legislators. Because, by the way, Murdoch's attorney, Dick Arpulian, a very powerful state senator, very influential in deciding who judges are, not just at the state level either. Harputlin's got influence in the in the Biden administration. He's got influence over the federal bench as well. But Newman said no. He said no, and as a result, this trial of the century in South Carolina, which should be open, because again, it's not just a trial of Alec Murdoch, folks. This is not just one person or one family or one law firm or one corrupt cabal down in the low country on trial, the entire system of justice in South Carolina is on trial in this case. Now, I do want to point out, because the Attorney General's office has gotten a lot of grief, including grief from my news outlet over this, I do want to point out, uh, Alan Wilson spoke, spokesman Robert Kittle has spoken with me on several occasions this week, and he has reiterated, Will, we can't talk anyway. We are bound by the rules of professional conduct not to comment on these pending cases before trial. So their argument from the beginning has been that this doesn't change anything for them. And that's a viable argument. And I do want to make that point. But Judge Newman, once again, had an opportunity to go the status quo route. He stood firm. So props to Judge Newman. And as a result, we're going to have a much more open process as this trial moves forward. All right. So in the last segment, I neglected to mention, I forgot to mention, that our news director, Mandy Matney, has a big story up this week that's riffing off of the report that our executive editor, Liz Farrell, did the previous week regarding Hakeem Pinckney. Now, Liz Farrell, of course, walked through this Hakeem Pinckney saga from the beginning to the very end. And Pinckney, of course, the quadriplegic taken advantage of by Alec Murdoch and his network of co-conspirators. Uh, but this week, as Mandy Matney exclusively reports on Fitz News, a settlement reached in that case between Pinckney's family uh, and the Palmetto State Bank and the former PMPED law firm where Alec Murdoch worked. So at least a little bit of financial justice for the family of Hakeem Pinckney. But I bring this up because I forgot to mention it in the last segment. And I want to talk a little bit about forgetfulness because as you get older, again, I'm only 47. I'm not that old, right? It's this gray beard, right? If you're not, if you're not watching the, I'm, I'm, I'm on the gray beard here, which I blame on my multiple children. But as you get older, you forget stuff, right? I mean, everybody can relate to that. But we had a discussion on the car ride back, and this is what I want to talk about. Dylan and I went to Greenville, Dylan Nolan, our director of special projects. We went to Greenville for 
uh, this Joe Cunningham event last week. Joe Cunningham, of course, the Democratic nominee for governor of South Carolina. And at the event, there's a sign on the table which you, where you walk in. you got all these different political placards and signs. And it said, end the geriatric oligarchy. And we did a big story on it this week. And this sparked some interesting discussion here in the office because I was of the opinion that this is ageism, that this is wrong. And again, maybe it's just because I'm getting, you know, halfway through my life, I'm getting a little older. Uh, but Dylan, the young 22-year-old buck that he is with his, you know, metabolism of a, you know, metabolism I don't have, folks. Let me tell you. Ooh, oh, hey, yo. Come on, man. That's uncool. Dylan just completely zoomed on the gut. Totally uncool, dude. But we had a discussion because I think this is, I think it's wrong, just as it's wrong to do term limits, I think it's wrong to do age limits on, on public officials. I just, and here's the thing, I used to be a big term limits guy. I used to support term limits. I used to think that it was good. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that we, we have term limits in the form of elections. If you don't like somebody, you can vote them out. Uh, but it also just seemed to me, what if we get people in office who are, are good for a change? Because there's some folks in South Carolina uh, politics, Tom Davis, State Senator Tom Davis. He's been in our studio several times. Tom is a guy who, why would you want to turn one at Tom Davis? Common sense libertarian, fiscal conservative, honest guy, honest broker. Why would you want to turn one at a guy like that? I wouldn't. And, and why would you want to put an age limit? Tom Davis is in good shape. He's still going to be kicking when he's 80. Why, why don't we want to throw him out of office for any reason? But anyway, it just it rubbed me the wrong way because it's just another example of how we as a culture not only are discriminating, number one, but we're putting these arbitrary boundaries on things, and we're forgetting that not everybody is the same. My grandmother lived to be 100, okay? 100. And she was compass menace right up to about 97. And right up to about 93, she was still tooling around Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, her red convertible, walking three miles on the beach every day at 93. No age limits on that woman. So why should we arbitrarily impose them on, on the people we elect? I just don't get it. I don't get it. I think it's wrong. I think it's discriminatory. And I think it it neglects to acknowledge that everybody's different. We got we to gotta have circumstantial discernment in life, people. We got to be able to look at one person, one situation and say, okay, there are differences here and they're not bad. They're not bad. But ultimately, we got to trust people to make the right decision. Can we do that in an era where most of the media is feeding them the same pablum, the same pre-approved garbage? Maybe that's the problem. Maybe it's not the problem that some, some of our elected officials are old. Maybe the problem is that the organs of communication they're using, the institutions that they're propping up, just spoon feeding the same stuff to people. Maybe that's the problem. So maybe it's the young bucks like my friend Dylan Nolan taking the tapioca pudding from the status quo. Maybe that's the issue, not the Dylan's laughing at me. You got some tapioca pudding on your uh, your chin there, Dylan. I wouldn't know what that is. I'm not old. <laughs> that's true. But seriously, young people... I mean, what do you think? And I want to ask this to all our readers, and I hope this sparks a discussion. Because, <clears throat> you know, Joe Cunningham's rally was all about ending the geriatric oligarchy. And so I want to ask young people, are you under the thumb of a geriatric oligarchy? And, oh, by the way, if you're Joe Cunningham, you just indicted your entire party's leadership. Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, Steny Hoyer, Jim Clyburn. And that's a nursing home. Uh, you know, talk about tapioca pudding. You know, I don't know why I'm dogging out tapioca pudding. I actually kind of like tapioca pudding. Because you're old. <laughs> Dylan talking trash this episode. But I want to have this discussion. The other discussion that we need to talk about from the Joe Cunningham event involves his lieutenant governor. And I want to get into this a little bit here because I do think it's important. We've talked about Tally Casey. She's a former fighter pilot. 
She's the managing partner of one of the most prestigious law firms in the state. Apparently, she's got three black belts in karate. I, I didn't know you needed more than one, but apparently she's got three ways to break pretty much anybody. So I wondered, when we attended this event, with all these amazing attributes, I wondered why Cunningham, Casey's husband, and Casey herself just went overboard extolling her role as a mother and the whole family values thing. And I get it. They're in Greenville. They're in a part of the state where that sells. And I, I also get it that all the amazing things about Tally Casey, fighter pilot, managing partner, uh, black belts, all those are amplified by the fact she she's doing all them while being a mother. I get it. That's sort of an amplifier. But folks, there are some serious allegations against this nominee. And again, they're just that. They're, they're just allegations. But they've been made in open court. Casey has acknowledged some of them in the court filings. And it just seemed to me an unforced error for them to go into that whole family value spiel knowing what's in these court files. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what's in those files today because we have not printed them. Uh, nor do I think will we ever actually print the actual documents. We haven't talked about them specifically. But at some point, they're going to come out. If not on this news outlet, another news outlet, and if not on a news outlet in a political mailing. But they are serious allegations. Some of the, some of the allegations, folks, I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, involve the alleged manufacture of drugs. And again, as a libertarian, I don't care about that, okay? If you, you want to grow something, make something in your own house, and by the way, we're not talking about pot. I want to put that on the record because I, I really wouldn't care if we are talking about pot, okay? We're not talking about pot. We're talking about another plant. <laughs> anyway, we're going to get into that in future episodes, but why do you play the family values card with, with that potentially hanging out there? When you don't need to, when you got all these other amazing things. Now, this news outlet has reached out to the Cunningham campaign. We have offered them the opportunity to have Casey on camera to address these preemptively. In other words, we will let her be the first one to specify what these allegations are and what her responses are, basically giving them the opportunity to frame this debate. I've even told the campaign we would let her see all of our questions ahead of time. That's right. But I don't want to ambush this woman. In fact, I don't want to ambush anybody that comes to this. I like thoughtful responses. I like letting someone have a chance to think about what they're going to say, because at the end of the day, I think that gives you, who's ultimately responsible for deciding what you think about it, a better choice, a better option. You get to see a reasoned response, a response that somebody's had time to think about. The gotcha journalist, I, I don't play that game. What do you put? You make somebody blush in a chair or whatever, or make somebody storm out, whatever. I don't do that crap. That's Jerry Springer people. But anyway, we're going to talk about Tally Casey in the weeks ahead. We hope we'll get her in the studio. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. Anyway, we know this is going to be an issue moving forward. So count on Fitz News to continue to cover the latest on that governor's race and the candidacy of Tally Casey for lieutenant governor. All right, so the Lindsay Edwards interview wasn't the only big video we dropped this week. Our director of special projects, Dylan Nolan, has been working long and hard on a documentary about Bowen Turner, the accused teen rapist from Orangeburg, South Carolina, whose sweetheart plea deal drew national indignation. Well, Turner finally ended up in jail. No thanks to the South Carolina system of justice, but he finally ended up in jail because he violated the terms of his parole from that sweetheart plea deal. And the Turner saga is just one that continues to get at me because it perfectly encapsulates every issue that we talk about at Fitz News, whether it's the corrupt judges, the shady prosecutors, the well-heeled defense attorneys who exert influence over those judges, it had everything. It had all the ingredients. But it's bigger than that because not only 
did it perfectly encapsulate all that's wrong with South Carolina's system of justice, but it has sparked a real movement to change it. The families of the victims and alleged victims of Bowen Turner, they are not going gently into that good night, folks. They are fighting. They are fighting. And in fact, I should have an update next week on the status of that fight because I'm sitting down with one of those family members to talk about the very latest in their efforts to get some real justice, not for their relative. That's too late for that. But for all the folks that are being put in this situation on a daily basis by a justice system that continues to re-victimize people instead of holding violent criminals accountable. Again, this is not complicated, people. Justice is supposed to hold people accountable for their actions. But we don't have that in South Carolina. We have well-heeled, rich lawyers who are in the state legislature, who appoint the judges, set their salaries, set their office budgets. Those are the ones who make the decisions. Judges aren't looking at the facts of cases. Judges are looking at who's representing who. Anyway, this documentary exposes that. And folks, if you haven't watched it yet, you need to. You need to, because this is a story that we've been telling for many, many months. But this puts it in a perfect half hour. Cases, interviews. In fact, I want to cut real quick. We had one segment, Laura Hudson. She and I used to go at it years ago. We were, we were antagonists, enemies, if you will. But over the years, we developed a, re- a friendship and respect for each other. And Laura was gracious enough to come into our studio and give an interview as part of this documentary. I want to cut real quick. Here's one of the excerpts from Laura Hudson's interview in the Bowen Turner documentary. Hmm. What a terrible case. What a travesty of justice. What a privileged, white, well-heeled person going through the system and having favors done for them. And none of those people would say, well, I did a favor for him. It's just done. Young man, criminal sexual conduct, accused, brought charges. While he's on bond, he commits another crime, another criminal sexual conduct, first water. Then we have a third one. And all of a sudden we, we, you know, we, we go right way past his bond violations, straight to a plea. And the plea was such a sweetheart deal. I mean, there again, makes it sound like a bar brawl. Makes it sound like he just had a little little scrap in a in a drunken bout. He's given while away, which only carries six years. Anyway, they had to plea it down to assault and battery in order to get him into the while away program because they're not supposed to put violent offenses in while away, and that's the Youthful Offender Act for those who don't know that. Um, then, you know, where well, you're going to be on five years of probation and you won't have to go on the sex offender registry. And that YOA, not even being class nonviolent, allows him to get an expungement. So he won't be known. Well, I've never known a rapist that raped one time. I've never known somebody that age 25 gets up and says, I think I'm going to be a rapist today. We're raising them. We're coddling them through the, ju- the juvenile system. And there's all this legislation from Senator Malloy and others and Hutto of let's change, you know, the judicial system so that people don't have to pay to go into the system. You know, we have to, the state has to absorb that. Um, that you know, all of these things in, in Senate 53 are just ridiculous. But there's, there's a, a, a movement nationally, you know, afoot to do that. And speaking of the national movement, it's creeping into South Carolina of, well, people shouldn't have to pay bond. Oh, they poor things. They can't, you know, they can't do that. Uh, let's just put them on GPS, which is a joke. The Turner case, a perfect example of what a joke it is. When he had on, you know, ankle, he violated, violated, violated. And I don't care how many times you go before a judge, and this is statewide, even in Lexington County, if you may, if you say, well, I saw him at, so, at such and such a bar, 
Well, did you tell a law enforcement officer? Did you get a warrant? Well, you know, that's not really a violation, Ms. Hudson, and we're not going to, you know, we're not going to put him in jail. You know, undoubtedly, me, Mr. Turner has decided that nobody has the right to tell him about anything to do. And then we want him to go back to his parents. What? Who've allowed him to, to act like this and have hired an attorney. And we want him to, you know, to be in a, a home where all this took place in the first place. I don't, that don't make any sense at all. Again, folks, if you haven't watched this in its entirety, you need to, because if you want a, a absolute case study and everything that's wrong with the way that South Carolina's system works, this documentary tells that story. I cannot thank Dylan Nolan enough for his work in putting it together. I cannot thank everyone who participated in it enough for their willingness to put themselves out there and tell their stories. Because, folks, if you watch that video, you will see not only just how bad the system has gotten, but the good part of that video is you will see just how committed these victims are to changing that system. And the fact we're able to play a part of that, that's why we do what we do, folks. And we're going to continue to play that role and continue to challenge that system at every turn. All right, that's a wrap for this week's editions of the Week in Review. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. By the way, we are over 10,000 YouTube subscribers now, I'm told. It's pretty amazing considering we've only been doing this a couple months for real. Uh, thanks to everybody for signing up and clicking. If you haven't already, by the way, click the little button down there. Just subscribe. It doesn't cost anything. doesn't take any time. And, but it helps us hold people accountable because the more that our leaders see that audience growing, the less likely they are to kind of pull the stunts they've been pulling in the Murdoch saga, the Bowen Turner story, or the Lindsay Edwards story. That helps us hold folks accountable, and that's what it's all about. So thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing, and we'll check you next time on The Week in Review.